Well, I'm going to get us started. We may have a few more people come in person and a few more join us on the um, Zoom, but we'll get started and we will say welcome to everyone who's here with us today. Um, this is our third session of the uh, a light, uh, the light of the World uh, series with Amy Jill Levine. And um, just an FYI, if you hadn't heard this message next week, which will be December 26th, we will not have a class, but we will do the fourth session on January 2nd. So just note, take note of that. So as we um, begin today, I, I sent an attachment to you with the scripture for today. I realized later that I had cut off the very, very end verses on that. I've got it printed in the classroom though for those with the whole piece on it. So uh, if you have a Bible at home with you too, you can have that. But I'm gonna have different volunteers read as we go through the scripture today. So um, I encourage you to have a copy. I won't make anybody read who doesn't want to, but if there's any volunteers, that would like to, to be a reader uh, when we get to that point. I will, I will call on you to, to read it aloud for us. So let me invite us uh, to begin with a prayer. Is there a volunteer who would be willing to lead us in the prayer that is on the screen? Okay, Jean. Loving God, God of Joseph and Mary, thank you for choosing to appear to us as a helpless child. Thank you for this time to study with others and learn more about the lives of Mary and Joseph and their journey to Bethlehem. Amen. 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 Thank you. So today this session um, focuses on Luke's telling of uh, the birth story of Jesus in the second chapter of Luke. And with Luke, this uh, birth narrative begins in Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph are, and then they travel uh, down to Bethlehem, where Jesus is born. Um, his telling the story that they start in Nazareth, Luke is putting this birth, this Jesus in um, the context of the Jewish people. But then he mentions about the census and he brings in um, the Roman census signal signaling you know, they have to travel to Bethlehem because of the census, that this baby is not just for the Jewish people, but there's a wider um, focus of why Jesus is coming. It's for the world. So, um, those kind of things that he includes in his gospel, which are a little different. We'll talk a little bit later about the differences between Matthew and Luke's telling of the birth story. But, but Luke is emphasizing that Jesus is Jewish, but he's also for the wider world. Um, so we're going to watch the video. And I invite you just maybe if you have a paper and pencil or just pay attention as we watch it. Um, jot anything down that maybe catches your attention or speaks to you in particular, or if you hear something that's new that maybe you'd not heard before, um, but we'll, we'll allow uh, Amy to lead us into um, our discussion through this video. So I'm gonna hopefully get it right as I switch my screens here. As far as we can tell from the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph and Mary have a home in Bethlehem. They relocate first to Egypt because Joseph, once again warned in a dream, is told, take the baby to Egypt because Herod the king wants to kill him. And when Joseph, again in a dream, learns that Herod had died, instead of returning to Bethlehem, where Herod's son, Herod Achelaus, is on the throne, he relocates up north to Galilee to a very small village called Nazareth 
and hence we have Jesus of Nazareth. But we have a different story in the Gospel of Luke. According to Luke, Joseph and Mary already live in Galilee and Nazareth. And because of this famous census that went out from Caesar Augustus that the entire world be enrolled, Joseph, along with Mary, his fiance, who was quite pregnant, move from Galilee in the north to Bethlehem in the south. Here's how the CEB puts it. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. Well, we don't actually have evidence of an empire-wide enrollment. Luke's point is less here historical rigor than setting Jesus on the world stage and giving us, giving Luke's readers the option. What Lord should be yours? The one who discombobulates an entire empire for the sake of taxes. In other words, for the sake of money going to him. Or this baby who will be shortly born and then placed in a stable. We are told the first enrollment occurred when Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's also an historical problem. But Luke has a reason for stressing Quirinius and stressing the census. And we know that from the book of Acts, which is Luke volume two. In Acts chapter five, Gamaliel, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, gets up and gives a speech to his fellow authorities, explaining why they should leave Peter and John and the rest of the church alone. And he says, well, remember at the time of the census, that was the census under Quirinius. It took place a couple of years later. And because of that census, there was actually a tax revolt led by somebody called Judas the Galilean. If we read Luke's story in light of Acts chapter five, we get a very profound message and the message comes from the census. Luke is telling us this new movement is not violent, it's not revolutionary, it's not about to take up arms and challenge the empire by using might against might and arms against arms. This is a new movement, whereas we learn from Mary's Magnificat the rich will be pulled down and the poor will be lifted up, but it will be done by grace and kindness and compassion and not by government and not by armaments. We are told that Joseph, who belonged to David's house and family line, went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. City, by the way, is pretty generous for Nazareth, maybe 50, 75 people, a small town as most of the villages in Lower Galilee were. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly, and we'll probably remember the King James version of swaddling clothes, and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the guest room. And then countless Christmas stories explain that they banged on door after door and all these mean innkeepers would not let them in. You're too poor, you're too dirty, you're from the wrong side of town. All of that is nonsense. The point of the story is that there was no room in the guest room for Mary to have the necessary privacy to have a baby. That's not the sort of thing you want to be done. Mary, privacy it was not ritual purity. The issue was not poverty. The issue is privacy. So Mary gives birth to her child, wraps him snugly, and lays him in a manger. And again, we get it wrong. We think about manger as a sweet little bed. We miss Luke's point. A manger is a feeding trough. And anybody who ever studied French would know that. The French word manger, M-A-N-G-E-R, means to eat. This is Luke's symbolism. Jesus will become bread for the world. Jesus will meet people at table. Jesus will make food appear miraculously. Jesus will have a significant final supper that he will ask his followers to reenact. Where else do you put this special baby but in a feeding trough to symbolize the food, the messianic banquet, the coming together of disparate people from disparate backgrounds all at a common table? And making this manger scene even more profound, one image that first century Jews had of the messianic world, the kingdom to come, the world to come, the kingdom of heaven is a giant banquet 
where everyone eats together, everyone is comforted, and everyone has enough. We might be able to experience that, or churches could, at a Eucharist, or a church supper, or any time they say, give us this bread. The manger scene evokes all of that and more. After the baby is born, an annunciation comes to shepherds who are outside keeping watch over their flock, which by the way tells us that the scene as Luke envisions it is not taking place in cold December because the shepherds would not be outside and neither would the sheep be. So we're probably thinking early springtime, maybe March or April. The shepherds hear the good news, glory to God in the highest, and they rush to greet the baby and his mother. And again, so many people get it wrong by talking about how the shepherds are impure or unclean. That's not the case here. Shepherds are not among the wealthy. They're probably among the poor. And these may in fact be the shepherds who guard the flocks that belong to the temple because sheep were used as part of the sacrificial offering. The point here is that the people attending the baby in this stable are not the royal courtiers. They're not the elite. They're not the kingdom representatives, but they're the representatives of this new kingdom, the common people, not impure or unclean, but just average everyday people and everyday people who, by the way, take care of others. The shepherds care for the sheep, and they visit Mary and the baby, Joseph and Mary, who take care of the child. In the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph has to protect Mary and the newborn child from the outrages of Herod the Great. The shepherds in the Gospel of Luke protect the sheep, and Joseph and Mary protect the baby. I think here, one of the major profound ideas about Christmas is that we need to take care of God. Part of the Jewish tradition suggests here in the words of the famous rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, that God is in search of man, or better, God is in search of us. God wants to be in relationship with us, but relationship has to be a two-way street. Not only does God take care of us, not only does God bring justice and compassion into the world, but we also take care of God here embodied in this helpless newborn child. According to the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is eight days old, Mary and Joseph arrange his circumcision, his initiation into the covenant with Israel. They're a good Jewish family, a pious Jewish family, and they also go to the temple. When the time came for their ritual cleansing in accordance with the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And that's where we have the prophecy of Simeon and we also meet the prophet Anna, two prophets, male and female together, welcoming baby Jesus. Following this, Mary and Joseph relocate back to their home in Nazareth in Galilee. The Gospel of Matthew will tell us a different story. When Mary and Joseph are still in Bethlehem after the child is born, they receive a visit. So instead of going to the temple and meeting people there, in the Gospel of Matthew, people come to them. Those are the Magi. All right. So uh, in the video, AJ says, God wants to be in relationship with us, but relationship has to be a two-way street. Not only does God take care of us, not only does God bring justice and compassion to the world, but we also take care of God here embodied in this helpless newborn child. So I'm going to just kick off our reflection on the video with that quote and just ask, 
what your response to her idea that um, God wants to be in relationship with us, with you, with me. Um, any responses to that, that comment that she makes? I, I, I think the first half of that we hear frequently, but I found uh, ear catching in in uh, her quote here of Rabbi Herschel uh, is that we need to take care of God by taking care of those in need around us. Um, so often I, I think we do not see that as maybe, well, A, we may not even see the people in need, but um, at least I've not conceptualized that as taking care of God. And yet that makes sense if we think those in need are uh, children of God who need, need care and so on, then we are indeed taking care of God. Yeah, when you're saying that makes me think of Matthew 25, when Jesus oh, yeah. talks about, you know, if you do it unto the least of these, so you do it unto me. Any other thoughts or reflections? Nick? Um, yeah, I take this, this idea of taking care of God a little bit differently. Um, to me, what is basically being said is that we need to be disciples for God. We need to proselytize for him. We need to bring other people to him. Um, and in that sense, we take care of him, that we're doing his work and his mission. But it's not like we have to, you know, pat him on the head or give him medicine. What we need to do is to give people an impression of who he is and to constantly increase the Christian beliefs. And taking care of God as sharing God with others and also living a life that would uh, reflect God's love, God's um, justice, all of that. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts? Just building on what Ernie said, I, you know, because I that struck me too. Wait a minute, we need to take care of God. But the whole idea of relationship being that that two way street, and in any relationship, there's learning that's happening. And as we're learning, we're learning to be reminded again of that idea that we are all created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So that takes us right back to seeing everybody around us as the image of God mm -hmm. and doing what we can to be in relationship and be. Seeing that image of God in each person. Yes. Julie. Does that mean if you're a reluctant believer, God's not going to continue to reach out to you? I wouldn't say that. Well, what does that mean? If it's a two-way street and one of the streets aren't working. Well, I would think any relationship, you know, among humans is, is a two-way street. So if one person in a relationship seems to make the effort, but the other person doesn't, I think maybe thinking of yourself as a parent. You know, if you've got a child, you're going to love that child no matter what. And you might want to be in a relationship, but maybe that child grows up and kind of goes their own way, you know, the prodigal son or daughter, and yet you still seek relationship, even if they're not in that moment, you know, having relationship that you would want them to come and that you will keep seeking it. But you can say that with friendships. You could say that with, with, you know, a, a spouse, you could say that between um, neighbors that, you know, you want to have that relationship. They don't seem open, but you might still keep praying about that, seeking ways to be a good neighbor, a good friend or offer. That's just my thoughts. Any, any other thoughts? Yes, I'd like to make a comment about covenant. Um, and the analogy about the parent and child is, is quite moving because as a parent, one's not going to, uh, in most cases, 
the parent's not going to, you know, abandon the child that's rejecting the parent. I mean, but there are, there are special cases, but basically, you know, a parent is going to be there when the child's out in left field and God at covenant in its most simple definition means a binding relationships, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. And scholars debate about the covenants in the old Testament, like what degree of like it with with Abrahamic covenant you've got later Sinai which is Sinai covenant grew out of Abrahamic covenant but the idea is that um, what degree of divine initiative is there and what degree of human response mm -hmm. seeing that they'll debate on what degree of divine initiative is in in in, in God's different covenant encounters but the point is, is that God went the distance through us in Christ to forge this covenant, which makes the relationship possible. Um, and and we, we believe that we are called with this responsibility uh, in the covenant relationship to be expressors and containers of um, of the love of Jesus Christ to the world. That's the Christian stance. And so uh, the Jewish perspective, if I understand it correctly, also is that there are responsibilities in this relationship with God. That they would concur about that. Thank you for bringing the idea of the covenant into this. That's a good, good point. Were there any other parts in the video that stood out to you or maybe something that you heard that was new to you? Bob. Oh, the, the feeding trough. The feeding trough. Danger symbolism. I guess if I stop to think about it, yes, but I, I never made that link. Uh-huh. The, the manger being the feeding trough mm -hmm. and, yeah. Symbolizing bread in the world. The messianic banquet. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was kind of a new aha for you. Julie, did I see you? Yeah, another one of the things that surprised me actually was um, that they really weren't looking for an inn to have comforts from the elements. They were looking for a place to have some privacy for the birth of this child. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Changes the story a bit. A little, yeah, Betsy. Well, when I was in Israel <laughs> several times, one of the things that was explained to us is that the houses, you know, weren't like houses we have now, right? They were built mostly of earth and stone, and because mm -hmm. there was not a lot of wood, and so you had these houses that were in, a, in kind of a round, almost underground kind of house, and so they had this area that they after they got themselves inside they would draw they would have all the animals on the outside so the inn was an in being inside where these people were and then there was the outside part where the animals were kind of to protect them from predators too and to keep them warm also so there was no place for Mary and Joseph in the inn with the people uh -huh. which is why they wound up in the barn or so to speak in outside okay? so kind of like the outer ring of a house okay that's interesting yeah. thank you and i and then and when twice that was explained to me that way so. yeah that's very interesting any other comments of things that caught your eye or stood out for you what really stuck stood out to me is we've heard this story we read the story for most of our Advent seasons in our lives. But what AJ is able to do is add such insight into the meaning and to the things that we haven't thought about. We read the story, we know the manger, um, but she adds all this incredible insight. Yeah. 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 Well, let me go on to our next slide. So, would, could I get a volunteer um, to read aloud Luke 2, verses 1 through 7? Is there a volunteer who'd be willing? Wayne is a volunteer when he finds his glasses. That's right. Go ahead. Good 
in those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to their firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Thank you. So as we've been talking about, and AJ said, um, Luke by placing Jesus in the manger is anticipating the communion story, which will come uh, later in the gospel. The town of Bethlehem, Bethlehem literally means house of bread, which I think is interesting too. So remember that this manger in Bethlehem, house of bread, um, is not only in Bethlehem, but then we have the Last Supper. Um, we also have other connections in, in the gospel that connect Jesus, um, where he shares meals with others. Um, Luke depicts the feeding of the 5,000 and meals with tax collectors and sinners, including Zacchaeus, um, meals with Pharisees, and uh, the dinner at Emmaus after his resurrection, um, where they take the bread and in the breaking of the bread, their eyes are open and they, they see this is the risen Jesus. Um, it, it, a meal in the eating the broiled fish uh, again after the resurrection. So um, by locating Jesus in the manger, uh, Luke is anticipating these other stories that he uh, will include in the gospel that he is writing. Um, and certainly the communion as we take this bread, and, you know, Jesus blessed it, broke it, we give it. And we, we do this every time we celebrate communion together. So would somebody be willing to read the next portion of the story, Luke 2, verses 8 through 20? I will read it. Thank you, Sue. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace among whom he favors. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorify God, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it has been told them. Thank you. So how does this angels appearing to the shepherds um, compare to the annunciation of the angel to Zechariah and to Mary? How, how, how do you see this um, comparing with those other announcements of the angel? It signified heaven uh, glorifying you know, the heavenly host. Um, uh, Amy Levin uh, touched in her chapter about this word host. 
Mm -hmm. She even said, um, well, um, in the Old Testament, um, John Golden Gay translates uh, Yahweh Sabaoth as uh, Lord of Armies. Mm -hmm. Use the word armies for hosts, but the idea is the angelic company. Mm -hmm. uh, the common English Bible translation that AJ uh, frequently quotes has an interesting expression of that. They call uh, suddenly a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel. Interesting. So that shepherds, um, the, the enunciation to the shepherds brings in the whole host, whereas Zechariah and uh, Mary's announcement is Gabriel. It's just that, that single angel. Um, what do you think the shepherds symbolize uh, in this story of Jesus' birth? Why do you think Luke would include that in his telling of this birth narrative? Betsy, well, it's, it's com the common people, the common and, it's, and it's young people, because the, the you know the old men aren't doing this. It's usually the, the youth <laughs> that are out doing the the shepherds, and um, the fact that they're just they're they're not. It's like you you know the clergy was Zachariah, right? Mm -hmm. And then you know this. This little, this little family to be was mm -hmm. the next, but here's these common people. This is for everybody. And maybe that's what the whole idea of the heavenly host coming to them, with all, all of them coming for all of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the, the, they are the common people. They are the, the more lowly um, people. And also probably in that community, everyone knew them and took their word. I mean, uh, one of the striking things is that, you know, they reported everything, all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. So they immediately responded by telling other people about this event. Mm -hmm. So thinking of Psalm 23, where we say the Lord is my shepherd, um, what does that kind of suggest about shepherds. Caretakers. Yeah, caretakers. They watch and care for the flock. Mm -hmm. And then God, you know, metaphorically takes care of God's people, takes care of us as the sheep, you know, when we're in danger, when we're going through the, the hard places, the, the shadow, the valley of death. Um, when Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, um, what image of Jesus do you have? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Protect you. If you think about Jenny, if, if you think about, you know, Jesus as the good shepherd, I mean, he, he would take care of his flock to the point where he would die to protect them. That's right. He would stand between those sheep and whatever was going to kill them, and he would take it um, to protect them. Yeah. How is shepherd different from Lord or King? You know, we, we call Jesus Lord, you know, but what's, you know, those are other titles that get assigned to Jesus too. So what, what, um, how is that different to, in your, your thinking? But if you think of a shepherd as caring for the sheep and you think of Jesus as the good shepherd and the example that he has set for us. That means that he would go to the extent of dying for us and that we should do whatever we could possibly do to help care for other people. Mm -hmm. That's our way of honoring our God and our commitment to our God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
servant role rather than the in charge, the authority role, it's the servant role. I, I, that term caregiver jumped out at me because a number of us have been caregivers. And when you are, it's the other person who is your priority. Yeah. So this is Christ making us his priority and caring for us. Yeah. And that puts him in the servant role. The servant, servant um, hood. Yeah. Lords and kings aren't always shepherd, and so it's a it's a it's a tough comparison to also then shift to Christ as Lord and King. But I think AJ makes the point that this is a very different, a very different king. We need to not just compare it to the Lord of the Manor or some some um, tyrant tyrannical king. Yeah, she, she, she's pulling out Luke's really emphasizing a difference in, between his kingdom and the kingdom of the political, you know, kings and wealth. And wealth. Yeah. And wealth. So it's the lowly versus the, the wealthy, the mighty, the powerful. Okay, let me go on to our next slide. Would somebody be willing? Oh, what happened? Ready? <laughs> what happened? Okay, this is different. <laughs> I'm going to try starting it over again here. Right. I, I have no explanation for what happened, but would somebody be, be willing to read um, this quote, which comes out of the book? If, if, if you have a book, it would be on page 92 if, if you didn't, but this comes out of the book. Do I have a volunteer to read that? I'll be happy to. Thanks. The sign the shepherds received is not a supernova or even the angel, it is those bands of cloth, the manger and the baby. The refusal to offer signs of supernatural status fits with Luke's infancy stories. The sign to Mary was the pregnancy of her cousin Elizabeth. Once we figure out the sign, whether of a pregnant woman, of a mother who has just given birth, of a newborn, even of baby clothes or a stable, our next step is to work out what that sign signifies. If we can start to look for the light of the divine in front of our eyes, rather than search the stars, we'll be ready when we hear stories of sowers and seeds, vines and fig trees, yeast and fish. Signs are all around us if we take time to look. Okay, thank you. So signs are all around us if we take time to look. How does that um, reflect your own experience of, of, do you notice signs around you or? No. <laughs> I think we're mostly rushing around and missing everything. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm trying to stop a little bit the pandemic has helped me to walk around, look carefully at things, and feel some sort of joy as the spring unfolds. I did that last year. We'll see if I do it again this year. Yeah, but okay. um, it's there's beauty there, and there's time to think. Don't be on your phone when you're walking. I We passed somebody today, and I thought, why are they on their phone walking? They should be looking around. Anyway, <laughs> that's my thought. Good thought. of us we see God in nature and I'm always grateful when God has the grace to give me the time to, to look. I just had a friend send me a text picture of a gorgeous sunrise, beautiful colors. This was a sunrise with the beautiful colors. Mm -hmm. And her little note on it was, look, God decorates for Christmas too. Oh. I just thought, 
you know, what a yeah. gift to be able to just see nature mm. and the amazing stuff about nature and know that it's God who created that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll get that note mm. or that phone call or such and such contacts me mm. or something seems coincidental but it, it happens so perfectly after i ask god a question i'm wondering <laughs> yeah, yeah. i got a direct answer kind of thing yeah yeah, yeah. Have, uh, have i've had those kind of experiences have, have others yes yeah 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 yes you didn't make it up it just confluence yeah. there yeah. you are <laughs> yeah uh -huh. well, and, and I have found, I've, I've over the course of my life at different times had a spiritual director, someone I meet with who just helps me kind of listen to my life and wh where I'm sensing I'm hearing God or not hearing God. Uh -huh. and, and sometimes just having another person where you're, you're sharing what's going on, you know, maybe a prayer partner or something that they can help you sometimes like notice something that maybe you're missing, you know, that look, it's right in front of you, you know, or three times you've mentioned this, you know, maybe that's a clue, you know, to what God's directing you to do. So I think you know, sometimes just each other, we can help one another identify, pay attention to signs. Yeah, go ahead, Julie. One of the things that, I, that struck me at today's sermon with God asking us to come home and that he encouraged us us to go to those people who can give us solace or wisdom or whatever. And yet I remember that sign I said that says, uh, I, uh, hello, I am God. I'm here to take care of your problems today. And so I'm thinking, well, that's contradictory because I have trouble looking around. And if I'm in a time of challenge, I look for some, I look for human solutions, mm -hmm. things that I can implement. And it's not until the solution is at work and taking care of the problem that I ask myself, no, where was God in all of this? But it's never during the labor. Mm -hmm. It's always after. Mm -hmm. So sometimes getting through times where God might seem absent to you, you might wonder where is God in this, but when you get on the other side of it and you can look back, you might be able to say, oh, when that person came alongside me, when this was offered to, you know, that there were things that you could maybe point to and say, there's God. I remember years ago, my husband and I left a church that we were serving together that was not a, a nice ending. We were very hurt by it and we were both so broken. We, we, neither of us were ready to go on and be a pastor again. So Steve went back to seminary and I went on and started doing a contemplative prayer program. But, um, I remember when we made the decision to leave the church saying to my husband, this is such a dark time. I, I trust God is in this, but I can't see it right now. And I'm looking forward to looking back. And that's exactly, and I tried through that as we're going through that dark time, I worked with a, a spiritual director who helped me. And I said, you know, I don't want to become bitter. You know, I want to, she was, if that's the prayer of your heart, you won't. And, um, but just trusting God is there, even when I can't see God, but being able to look back, um, sometimes we're able to identify those signs that we miss in the moment. What always strikes me is that God had, had to be there uh, because the solution was successful. I mean, it could have been sour. It could have been a sour solution, you know? Yeah. Um, Jenny, it's Jenny. Um, there's a song that I have always liked and it's by Linnell uh, Harris. It's called uh, In It After All. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says, okay. so you are in it after all. 
all of those moments I spent crying and something inside me was dying. I didn't know that you heard me each time I call. You had a reason for those trials. It seemed I got stronger every mile. Now I know you were in it after all. I mean, it goes on many verses, but sometimes it takes years to realize that God was in, in a circumstance that you thought you were all alone with. Yes. Um, and sometimes those circumstances are changed and sometimes they remain the same, but that, um, uh, that insight that God gives you, that he has guided you for your whole life. And he knows, um, he knows every step that you make and he is in all of it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So um, I've gone on to the next slide and, and, and AJ says, there's nothing particularly special about what the, the shepherd's eyes see. There's everything special about how they interpret what they see. So how do the shepherds interpret what they see? Well, they clearly interpret it as, as God's action. They returned home glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Yeah. Why do you think the sign that they're given is um, a newborn child wrapped snugly in a manger? Why do you think that's the sign that God's given? Vulnerability of a, of a baby, the mm -hmm. vulnerability of a baby, okay? Mm -hmm. Because there's, uh, you know, the, obviously that there's, I mean, if this is God making himself vulnerable to us. You know, and as far as the shepherds go, they, they got this vision, which is pretty stunning. Mm -hmm. And then they go and they find it. And it's like, what? You know, mm -hmm. so they're going to, of course, they're going to say, hey, this is what happened. Can you believe it? And then there's this baby and there's God. Of course, we always show them like your picture is glowing. Yeah. You know, whether that was the case or not, or it was just a baby at night, you know, whatever. But um I think it's it's kind of amazing that God allowed Himself, you know, to to come that way. That yeah. was an amazing thing. So God really entrusted God's self in this vulnerability of a baby, um, and, then, and these these shepherds who are pretty nothing, you know, in right. in terms of social status, were the ones who identified this very common vulnerable baby um, as that fulfillment of what the angel had told them. Um, how do you think the shepherds might be functioning as a sign to Mary? I, I think the fact that the shepherds show up, the magi show up, um, all this attention is there in the star. They realize this is a huge event um and, it, and as amy says and i think it's, it's one of the real messages we can't lose sight of is this was a religion for the poor the messiah who comes is not a warrior or a king he's it comes in the form of a baby a vulnerable baby who will grow up to be you know the strongest of all but the fact that they can identify with the fact this is a baby, he's poor, his parents are displaced, um, even under very strange circumstances. There's a recognition that there's a huge change taking place here. And it's a big social change because it is for the poor. And it's going to, it's going to challenge the Roman Empire and all the strength and forces that are in the world at the time. And so 
it's got great depth to it. it. It's got great social meaning. It's got great politics attached to it. And I think they start to realize that this is something totally different than even they thought would happen. Yeah, Mary and Joseph, you know, they've had well, Mary had the visitation from Gabriel. Joseph in Matthew's gospel has a dream, so he, he has his own visitation. Um, so they've gotten some things that Elizabeth has, you know, kind of confirmed for Mary. Now these shepherds, so they keep kind of getting like, because you had to wonder, you know, even though you've had this, like, did I imagine all that? You know, so having another person come into the story to add their confirmation of what God you think God's been telling you I would think had to be encouraging to them but also helping them like you're saying Nick hear the, the wider implications of this child you know what he's going to be all about so there's two nar two nativities um, in the gospels one is in Matthew and one is in Luke and uh, they each tell the, the story from a different angle, from a different perspective. So Matthew tells the story through Joseph's perspective. Uh, so in, in that gospel, we don't hear Mary getting the visitation from Gabriel, we, but we hear about Joseph. And, and, you know, Matthew mentions that Mary's with child, but it's Joseph who's you know, going to dismiss her and he gets that visit from the angel saying, no, 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 don't, don't do that. This is of God. And, um, and so we're, we're hearing this from, Matt, from uh, Joseph's perspective in, in the Matthew telling, there's no manger. There's no um, talking about the birth itself, the way it does in Luke. Um, we, we hear in Matthew, a concern with the response of, the Gentiles uh, to this um, Jewish kings. So he's going to tell the story of the Magi, who are not Jews, who will, will come. Um, and then he's going to talk about Herod's um, reaction to the Magi's announcement um, and his being threatened by the, what they have told him about this baby. And, and again, Joseph's responding um, of how God tells him to take the baby and marry and, and go away to Egypt to protect them from Herod and from the wrath that's about to descend. Luke's nativity um, is different in that Luke's nativity keeps, Luke is keeping his eye on the gospel, on the good news message, which is the lifting up of the lowly. And Luke's gospel tells the story through Mary's perspective. Um, turning our attention to Mary's Annunciation and, and Elizabeth and the birth itself. And then with, with the, um, the shepherds, and, and then when we get to the next part, them going to the temple and Anna and Simeon. Um, so he's, Luke is turning our attention to Jesus um, heritage uh, in Israel, his heritage as a Jew and um, his identity, um, he's gonna lift that up with this next portion of the story that he tells of Mary and Joseph taking Jesus uh, on the eighth day, which is the practice for his circumcision, taking him to the temple uh, to dedicate him. Um, and at the time of Jesus and to this day, circumcision is a sign of Jewish identity a sign of God's covenant, let Sue mention, um, with Abraham. Um, Luke offers in his gospel the first quote from the Torah where he says, it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. So Luke's infancy narrative insists that the Old Testament should not be dismissed. Um, Luke claims for followers of Jesus, people like us, that the traditions of ancient Israel um, are not to be overlooked and not to be uh, dismissed. And, and in, in her book, she talks more about, she's, Marcion was this, um, in the early church, he, he felt like the Old Testament was not, um, like we should ditch it, that that was not of, of God, of Christ. 
Um, so this, he's Luke's making a very different emphasis, saying no, the New Testament or the Old Testament which were the only scriptures that Jesus and the people in this story had. They, they didn't have a New Testament, you know, so we, we, we don't want to dismiss those stories. So let me go on to um, the, the last portion here. Would somebody be willing to read Luke 2, 25 through 38, which is the story of Anna and Simeon? I'll do it. All right. Thank you. Now there was a man in Jerusalem, 25, right? Yeah. yeah. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been re revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and with a parent, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the redemption revelation to the gentiles and for glory to your people israel is that it no and the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him then simeon blessed them and said to his mother mary this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was the, also the prophet Anna, the daughter of Phenuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Is that it? Thank you. So what does Anna do is, is immediately after she sees Jesus? Prophesies. She prophesies, she praises God, yeah. Yeah. And why do you think Mary and Joseph are uh, amazed by what they hear from Simeon? I think it's because it included the Gentiles. This is also that all this evidence keeps piling up. Yeah. To them. Yeah. It's coming again. What's happening here? You know? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm gonna just move us along because we're, it's, we're at the end of, of the companion for five more minutes. Um, in the book on page 106, AJ says, the Greek literally says, a sword will pierce your own soul. Jesus is not the only one who will suffer. His mother letting her son go from her to his death will suffer as well. That comment reminds me of John 1934. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. This description in John's gospel hints at Jesus metaphorically giving new birth to his followers. It is through the gift of his body that they can be, as he tells Nicodemus, born anew. When Jesus dies, John tells us that his mother is at the foot of the cross, and there she feels the sword and the life draining from her as well. Any response to what EJ's pointing out here? Thank <laughs> you. 
getting this good, you know, it keeps piling up, um, like I think Gabrielle said, but that's sort of a twist in the story there with that, you know, there's going to be a sword's going to pierce your soul. This is, this is going to be um, hard. Well, isn't the point that we, we kind of all are crucified and we all die with our Lord in the sense that we suffer, we feel terrible pain, um, we're changed through that suffering, and that pierces our own soul, it changes you know, the world at large. But the point is to be born anew, you have to go through some sort of pain and suffering to be changed to be different. Thank you. Well, I don't want to let it go too late. So we are at the close. Any final reflections, comments, questions that anybody has um, before we go to our closing prayer? Just one comment I, I'd like to make, and it goes back to Sue, Sue Fry's comment about a covenant. And, and I think it's really important. It's essential to what the message is, and that is there's an offer that comes from Jesus. Um, but it's up to us to, to do the acceptance. We can reject it, we can ignore it, or we can embrace it. But it's our choice. And the fact he's always there with his eternal love, but not everybody accepts it. Not everybody will embrace it. Not everybody will believe it. And I think that's the difference between believers and non-believers, is that acceptance of the offer. You know, in legal terms, it's a contract between you and the Lord. It's a covenant, it's a contract. There's an offer made, and you're the one who decides over acceptance. Thanks, Nick. Now, Jenny? Yeah. Yes. Um, this week, I came across an article that people might be interested in, in checking out. It was published in the Biblical Archaeology Society's uh, daily uh, posting. Mary, Simeon, or Anna, who first recognized Jesus as Messiah? And it was written by Ben Witherington III. So if anybody's interested, um, you know, it, it's available there. It's, it's also, I believe, a part of the... Um, our publication, the Biblical Archaeology Review. Do you, do you have a link like you could send to me? Because I could send it out in an email to the class that people could get. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'm not real adept at it, but I'll try. Okay. If you're able to send me a link to it. Yeah, okay. I can share that link in an email with the rest of the class that people okay. can check that out. Thank you. Jenny? Yes, uh, it's Joni. Can I just uh, make one comment too? Yes. Um, there's a universality to birth. We are all born the same way of water and blood. And um, I, th I, I think that that's emphasized in what Mary sees at the foot of the cross. Um, when she bore Jesus, there was water and blood. And when she, when he died, the evidence of his death was the water and the blood. Yes, there is very much an earthiness um, to this gospel. Yeah. And yet the Gospel Luke is giving us a great message that it's not just that there was this baby who came and this man eventually dies and it's going to pierce Mary's soul too. But as the angels announce that this is the Savior. And so both Matthew and Luke use this term. And they use these words, which have great import, Savior. Uh, look, those who are looking for the redemption of Israel, and they had an idea about what that means that Amy Levin talked about in the Old Testament. 
But then there's this concept of Jesus offering himself for us. Mm -hmm. And that is a shelter that is so great that uh, I don't have words for us. Mm -hmm. But um, with this kind of God who was vulnerable as an infant and vulnerable to uh, God gave God's self to us, the triune God did through what Jesus has done. And so we have a responsibility to those around us that they would know this good news and be invited to it. And yet we also have a responsibility to be the type of people that demonstrate God's love and justice and compassion in the world. And I think that that's just profound. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I'm going to close us with this prayer and um, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Um, I don't know how many of you will be here on Christmas Eve, but I, I pray that everyone has um, a healthy Christmas and um, I will be here Christmas Eve. I will not be here next week. I'm taking a week off. Um, but I'll be back in January, so I wish you a happy New Year as well. Blessed uh, New Year. So uh, let's join our hearts for a closing prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you came to announce God's good news for the world. Guide us as we seek to encounter you in scripture and in our interactions with one another Grant us the courage to say yes to the difficult challenges we face in our own lives, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Glad that the in-person and the Zoom um, friends are, are with us today. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Merry Christmas. Bye. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas.